Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the why, what and how of newspaper reading. Today we will discuss the articles displayed on the screen from the daily edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 30th October 2018 and the time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. So let us start our discussion for the day. So before starting the discussion for today's newspaper, let us take a question that was asked in the general studies paper 3 of the mains examination and which was also covered in the DNS, focus and QIP etc. So today we will discuss a question related to the left wing extremism and it falls under the part of internal security in the general studies paper 3. So now if you look at the syllabus of the general studies paper 3, it talks about linkages between the development and spread of extremism. And if you look at the question, the question briefly required you to explain the government of India's approach to counter the challenges posed by the left wing extremism. Now if you look at the government of India's approach, it is a multi pronged approach and it targets mainly two aspects. First is the security aspect in the left wing extremism areas and second is related to the development in those areas so that extremism does not spread further. Now the question reads, left wing extremism is showing a downward trend but it still affects many parts of country. Secondly, the question requires us to explain the government of India's approach to counter the challenges posed by left wing extremism. Now this question basically has two aspects. One is the static aspect and the second is related to the current affairs part. Now if you look at the current affairs part in this question, it is related to the downward trend and it was in news in the month of May and it was covered widely in DNS and focus. And this downward trend in the left wing extremism was because of the implementation of National Policy Action Plan 2015 by the government of India. So this was another aspect of the current affairs which was related to this question. Now the overall approach to handle the left wing extremism is basically covered in the static parts of Nazism and this includes development, tribal rights which can include further the Forest Rights Act, effective implementation of the PESA Act or the Panchayat Extension Act in tribal areas, it can be related to education improvement in those areas, it is also related to connectivity and representation that is the political empowerment of people in those areas. Now all these aspects are basically covered in any standard book related to left wing extremism or Nazism. However, we will only focus on the current affairs aspect of this question which is basically related to the national policy action plan of government of India and the downward trend in the left wing extremism. Now the first aspect of the question which was related to the downward trend in the left wing extremism was covered in the daily news simplified of 21st March 2018. As you can see, it was covered under the data point in The Hindu and it shows us that the incidents related to the left wing extremism have declined in last three years. However, casualties both civilian and security forces have increased in some states. And as can be seen from the data, the incidents of left wing extremism in the state of Chhattisgarh have decreased from 466 in 2015 to 373 in 2017. However, the casualties of both civilians and the security forces have not decreased. And in the state of Chhattisgarh, the casualties were around 101 in the year 2015. However, they increased to 130 in the year 2017. Now, this was one of the points which could have been used in answering that question. And this includes that the left wing extremism incidents are showing a declining trend. However, the number of casualties have generally increased. Again in the daily news simplified of 1st June 2018, we discussed about the decreasing trend of left wing extremism. And in this, a report by Ministry of Home Affairs has highlighted that 44 districts are now out of danger of left wing extremism. However, it has increased in 8 new districts. So in this line, you could have drawn this map to show the red corridor of India, that is those states which are affected by left wing extremism or Naxalism. Now as discussed earlier, the Ministry of Home Affairs has been implementing the National Policy Action Plan since 2015 to combat left wing extremism. Now you can see that this aspect of the National Policy Action Plan was covered in the focus of May 2018. And under this National Policy and Action Plan, the Ministry of Home Affairs had initially categorized 106 districts in 10 states as affected by left wing extremism. And amongst these 106 districts, the MHA had identified 35 districts as being most affected by the left wing extremism and they termed these districts as most affected districts. Now highlighting the declining trend of left wing extremism, the article that was covered in focus highlights that since 2015, the incidents of violence have seen a 20% decline 
with a 34% reduction in related deaths. Further, the article highlights that the geographical spread of left-wing extremism violence has also shrunk from 76 districts in 2013 to 58 districts in 2017. It further highlights that 30 of these districts now account for 90% of left-wing extremism in the country. So these points could have been used in highlighting the declining trend of left-wing extremism in India. Now this article further highlights that according to a survey by the Ministry of Home Affairs, 44 districts have been excluded and 8 new districts have been added. The article further highlights that 90 districts in 11 states will now be covered by the scheme down from 126 and the list of most affected districts has been reduced to 30 from previously 36. Now the second part of the question which required us to explain the government's approach to tackle the left-wing extremism has been covered again in the DNS of 1st June 2018. Now regarding the government's approach you should know that the government has been implementing National Policy and Action Plan 2015 and it basically comprises of four elements. First is an integrated and multi-pronged strategy comprising of security related measures. So this basically highlights and focuses on security related measures for handling left-wing extremism. The second is related to development related initiatives that we have discussed in the static part of this question. Thirdly, it talks about ensuring rights and entitlements related measures. So in this part, we have talked about the tribal rights and which can further include the implementation of Forest Rights Act and the effective implementation of PESA. And the fourth part is related to the management of public perception. So these are the four aspects of the National Policy and Action Plan 2015. Further, this DNS highlights that creation of left-wing extremism division in Ministry of Home Affairs is also one of the approach by the government of India to tackle left-wing extremism. And in this, the DNS explains that the left-wing extremism division was created in 2006. And this was created in order to effectively address the left-wing extremism insurgency in a holistic manner. Further, this division implements security-related schemes which are aimed at capacity building in left-wing extremism affected states. Further, this division also monitors the left-wing extremism situation and various countermeasures taken by the affected states. And finally, this division coordinates the implementation of various developmental schemes of government and states affected with left-wing extremism. So in the DNS and the focus, we have covered the current affairs part of the problem of left-wing extremism and which includes the government's approach to tackle left-wing extremism and also the declining trend of left-wing extremism in India and which has been a result of the implementation of this policy. Now some of the static and the current affairs related part of the Naxalism or the left-wing extremism were covered in the quality improvement program as well. And the Naxalism theme which was covered in the QIP also highlighted the national policy and action plan 2015 of the government. Further, it talked about which states are included in the left-wing extremism affected areas. And it also talked about the changing scenario of left-wing extremism in India. And finally, it highlighted the strategy of government in handling the left-wing extremism. Further, in the main test series, a question was asked related to the government's approach by the implementation of National Policy and Action Plan 2015 and also about the impact of National Policy and Action Plan 2015. So all the points that we have discussed in the DNS focus, QIP and the main test series could have been used to answer the question that was asked in paper 3 of the mains examination in 2018. And in this, you could have highlighted the static part from any standard book and also drawn a map which was used in the DNS. With this, let us move on to the discussion of today's newspaper. This article on page number 13 is related to a currency swap agreement that has been signed between India and Japan. So it will form a part of the preliminary examination syllabus under the topic international relations or current events of national and international importance. And it will also form a part of the economic development of India. So in this article we will try to understand what is a currency swap agreement, what are the advantages of currency swap agreement and how will this currency swap agreement benefit India. Now this is in news because India and Japan have agreed to enter into a bilateral currency swap agreement of $75 billion. And one important fact related to this currency swap agreement is that it is one of the largest currency swap agreement in the world. Now what is a currency swap agreement? So simply it is an agreement to exchange currency between two foreign countries. And this exchange of currency basically helps a country to reduce its exposure to anticipated fluctuations in the exchange rate. And as we know that Indian currency is facing depreciation in the present times. 
so this exchange agreement or the currency swap agreement becomes extremely important for india further another important purpose of engaging in a currency swap agreement is to procure loans in foreign currency at a favorable interest rate rather than borrowing directly from the foreign markets now rather than getting into the details of currency swap agreement you should know that these exchange agreements or the currency swap agreements helps a country to reduce its exposure to the anticipated fluctuations in exchange rates and they also help these countries in procuring loans at more favorable interest rates so these are the two important advantages of a currency swap agreement let us look at some of the advantages for india from this currency swap agreement with japan now under this agreement an agreed amount of foreign capital is available to india as and when it requires that amount so as and when the need arises india can raise that foreign capital under this agreement so basically there is no immediate cost or any interest that india has to pay so only when india withdraws a particular amount the interest or the cost comes into picture now as the agreement is worth dollar 75 billion india does not have to pay interest on this amount but for instance india withdraws dollar 35 billion after a period of 2 years there will be no cost for india for these 2 years because india has not withdrawn any amount and only when india starts withdrawing some amount the interest or the costs come into picture the second advantage for india is that it would bring greater stability to foreign exchange and capital markets in india and the consequence of this will be that there will be improved market sentiments in india now such agreement is further important for india because it can be used in times of currency fluctuations and we know that the first line of defense for india against the currency fluctuations is the foreign exchange reserves with the reserve bank of india and we know that presently it is about dollar 393.5 billion however with this agreement this will become a second line of defense for india and such agreement and the amount that has been agreed can be used to stop the currency fluctuations and we know that indian currency is depreciating in the present times so it will be further more advantages for india to use this currency swap agreement with japan and under this we know that india can acquire yen or dollars from japan up to dollar 75 billion in exchange for rupees so simply india can swap its currency with the yen or dollar and this will help india meet its short term liquidity mismatches and we know that this will help in curbing the fluctuations in indian currency and further you should know that such an agreement would be reversed after an agreed period and as india can acquire yen and dollars from japan similarly japan can acquire us dollars from india in exchange for their yen so this provides both these countries to meet their short term liquidity mismatches as well as they help them in checking the currency fluctuations so these advantages for india are very important for us from exam point of view now let us look at a question which can be asked in the preliminary examination from this information now if you look at the previous year questions these two questions were asked in the year 2017 in the preliminary examination and both these questions required us to analyze the advantages of certain steps taken by india for example what is or are the most likely advantages of implementing goods and services tax and another similar type of question was that what is the importance of developing the chabahar port by india in this case the correct answer was that india will not depend on pakistan for access to afghanistan and central asia further the question that was related to the importance of implementation of gst the statements read it will replace multiple taxes collected by multiple authorities and will thus create a single market in india now this statement was correct however the second and third statements were incorrect this is because the second statement reads it will drastically reduce the current account deficit of india and will enable it to increase its foreign exchange reserves you know that goods and services tax has no relation with current account deficit or the foreign exchange reserves third statement reads it will enormously increase the growth and size of indian economy and will enable it to overtake china in the near future now this statement is also vague and the basic purpose of implementation of gst is not to overtake china however growth is one of the factors so this statement becomes incorrect so the correct answer in this case was a1 only so after going through the importance of such type of questions now this article is in news because india will host pakistan and seo members in an exercise on urban disaster management it will specifically focus on earthquakes related disasters and it will be held in india in november 2018 so under this article we will try to understand the key aspects of the shanghai cooperation organization and this will fall under the general studies paper 2 of the mains examination under the topic 
important international institutions, agencies, fora, their structure and mandate. And these aspects are also important for us from preliminary examination point of view. Now regarding the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, you should know that it is an intergovernmental international organization. And it was formed in the year 2001 in Shanghai in China. And the founding members were six in number. And these countries were Kazakhstan, China, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. So these are the names of six founding members of SCO. And these are important for us from exam point of view. Now presently there are eight countries. And these include India and Pakistan other than the six founding nations. So both these aspects should be kept in mind from preliminary examination point of view that founding members were six in number. And after that, India and Pakistan have joined SCO and the membership has increased from six to eight. Now regarding the objectives of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the first one is to strengthening mutual trust and neighborhoodliness among the member states. And the focus of this organization is mainly Central Asian countries. So it aims at strengthening mutual trust among Central Asian members and the neighbors of these countries. Further, it aims at promoting effective cooperation in various areas like politics, trades, economy, etc. Further, it aims at making joint efforts to maintain and ensure peace, security and stability in the Central Asian region. Further, this organization aims at moving towards establishment of a democratic, fair and rational new international political and economic order. Now, the aspect related to India's membership of SCO is important for us from preliminary examination point of view because various decisions were taken at various summits. So in this line, the SCO first decided to admit India and Pakistan in its UFA summit in 2015. Further, the formal process of India and Pakistan joining the SCO began at the Tashkan summit in 2016. However, finally, it was at the Astana or the Kazakhstan summit in 2017 that both India and Pakistan were officially named as members of SCO. So this is the summit where India and Pakistan formally or officially became the members of SCO. The decision for admitting India and Pakistan was taken at UFA summit in 2015. So this aspect can be a very important aspect for your preliminary examination point of view. Now another important fact from preliminary examination point of view is that the Peace Mission 2018 military exercise which will be held in Russia would make SCO the first platform after the United Nations peacekeeping forces for joint military engagement between India and Pakistan. So this is the only platform after the UN's peacekeeping forces that India and Pakistan will have an engagement in terms of their military. So all these aspects that we have discussed under the Shanghai Cooperation Organization are important for us from exam point of view. With this, let us move on to the next article. This article on page number nine is related to the personal data leakage by Facebook and it argues that a regulatory regime such as the general data protection regulations which has been implemented by the European Union should be enforced beyond the borders of European Union. So this will form a part of the preliminary examination syllabus under the topic current events of international importance. Further, it will also form a part of general studies paper three under the topic awareness in the fields of information technology. So let us try to understand some of the key points that have been highlighted by this article. Further, we will also try to understand some of the key facts which are related to the GDPR rules or general data protection regulation. Now let us look at some of the important highlights of this article. So this article highlights that the European Union's general data protection regulations must be enforced beyond the region of European Union. This means that countries other than the European Union should also adopt the European Union's GDPR, that is general data protection regulations. Now supporting this argument, the author has highlighted that data theft has become a grave problem for the present world and it has led to various security related concerns because of data theft. And the instances of data theft and security concerns have been raised in the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook data theft scandals that we are aware of. Further, you should know that recently Facebook announced that due to a security breach, data of nearly 50 million personal users was leaked. So it is due to these dangers of data theft and security concerns that author has highlighted the importance and the implementation of European Union's general data protection regulations. So now let us understand some of the basics that are related to the EU's general data protection rules or EU GDPR. So simply these rules aim to create more consistent protection of consumer and personal data across the European Union's nations. 
So it is basically related to the protection of personal data across EU nations. Secondly, the GDPR rules set standards for companies to handle the EU citizens' data. And these GDPR rules also set the standards for safeguarding the processing and movement of the EU citizens' personal data. And you should know that India's draft bill on data protection, which has been created on the suggestions of B and Sri Krishna committee, also draws inspirations from these rules of EU's GDPR. Now some important highlights of the EU's GDPR rules are that these rules require the consent of the persons for their data processing. So without the consent of any person, the data cannot be processed further. Further, these rules provide for anonymity of the person from whom the data has been collected. And this has been done in order to protect the privacy of that person. Further, these rules provide for providing the notifications that are related to data breach. For example, it is due to these rules that Facebook recently highlighted the breach of 50 million users' data. And further, these rules also provide for safely handling the transfer of data across borders. So these are some of the highlights of EU's GDPR rule. Now what was the impact or the importance of EU's GDPR rules in disclosing the breach of data? Now you should know that EU's GDPR regime came into force in May 2018. And these regulations forced Facebook to go public with the breach even before the full extent of damage was assessed. So it is because of EU's GDPR rules that Facebook had to make public that the data of some of the personal users has been breached. This is because the GDPR stringent guidelines requires the companies to make such events known within three days of their discovery. So as and when the Facebook got to know about this data breach, it had to bring that in public domain. So the author has highlighted that EU's GDPR rules have not only ensured awareness of such data breach, but these rules also provide for prompt corrective measures with respect to data security. So it is in this background that the author has highlighted the importance of EU's GDPR rules. And he has further argued that nations beyond European Union should also adopt such regulations for the protection of personal data. Now let us look at the importance of this article from our preliminary examination point of view. Now if you go through the previous year paper of the preliminary examination of the year 2017, you will find that two similar questions were asked. Now this question that was asked in 2017 reads, the global infrastructure facility is a... So the correct answer in this case was, it is a World Bank collaboration that facilitates the preparation and structuring of complex infrastructure, public-private partnerships to enable mobilization of private sector and institutional investor capital. So this question was simply related to the purpose of global infrastructure facility and it also asks about the organization which is related to the global infrastructure facility. Now the second question that was asked in 2017 read, Broad-based trade and investment agreement or BTIA sometimes seen in news in the context of negotiations held between India and. So the correct answer in this case was A, that is European Union. So such simple questions can be asked based on general data protection rules as well. So you should try and answer this question from preliminary examination point of view and put your answer in the comment section. With this, let us move on to the next article. You should try and answer this question from preliminary examination point of view and put your answer in the comment section. With this, let us move on to the next article. This article on page number 7 is related to a WHO's report which states that children under 15 are at serious risk from air pollution. So this will form part of the general studies paper 3 of the mains examination under the topic environmental pollution. Now as per this report of WHO, every day about 93% of world's children under the age of 15 years breathe polluted air that puts their health and development at serious risk. And regarding this report, you should know that it was released on the eve of WHO's first ever global conference on air pollution and health. So this point becomes important for us from preliminary examination point of view. That is, the first ever global conference on air pollution and health has been organized by the WHO. Now let us look at the important highlights of this report. So this report highlights that air pollution affects the neurodevelopment and cognitive test outcomes or the memory related test outcomes of the children. Further, it negatively affects the mental development of children. It also affects the lung functions of children even at low levels of exposure. Further, the report highlights that globally 93% under 18 years of age are exposed to PM 2.5 levels which are above the WHO guidelines. The report further highlights that in low and middle income countries, 98% of all the children under the age of 5 are exposed to 
PM 2.5 levels above the WHO guidelines. And in high income countries, the figure is at about 52%. Further, the report highlights that about 6 lakh deaths across the world in children under the age of 15 years is attributed to ambient and household air pollution in 2016. The report further highlights the adverse consequence of air pollutions on pregnant women. And regarding this, it highlights that when exposed to pollution, the pregnant women are more likely to give birth prematurely. And also such women are likely to give birth to small and low weight children. So these are some of the important adverse impacts of pollution which have been highlighted by the report of WHO. Now an important campaign by the World Health Organization against the adverse impact of pollution is the Breath Life Air Pollution Campaign. And it is a joint campaign by World Health Organization and the United Nations' Environment and the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, that is CCAC. And this joint campaign aims to mobilize cities and individuals to protect health and planet from the adverse impacts of air pollution. Further, it works with municipalities to expand monitoring efforts that can keep citizens informed and facilitate more sustainable urban development. So from preliminary examination point of view, the name of this campaign is important. And further, you should know that it is a joint campaign of World Health Organization and the United Nations' Environment and the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Now, if you look at the question that was asked in 2017, it reads, consider the following statements. The first is that Climate and Clean Air Coalition or CCAC, about which we have recently read in this article, aims to reduce short-lived climate pollutants is a unique initiative of G20 group of countries. The second statement reads, the CCAC or the Clean Air Coalition focuses on methane, black carbon and hydrofluorocarbons. Now, if you go through the website of CCAC, you will find that CCAC is a voluntary partnership of governments, intergovernmental organizations, businesses and scientific institutions and the civil society organizations. So in this regard, the first statement is incorrect. And regarding the second statement, the website of CCAC shows that it focuses on short-lived climate pollutants. And these include black carbon, methane, hydrofluorocarbons and tropospheric ozone. So this statement is again correct. So correct answer in this case was B, that is two only. So all these initiatives related to air pollutions are important for us from exam point of view. And it is in this background that you should try and answer this question from your preliminary examination point of view and put your answers in the comment section. With this, let us move on to the next article. Now, another news which is related to air pollution appears on the page number 7 and it highlights that Delhi tops the national charts in bad air quality. And the same has been highlighted by the graph that has been given in this news article. And this again will form a part of the General Studies Paper 3 under the topic Environmental Pollution. Now, we know that recently a report by the World Health Organization highlighted that 14 out of 20 most polluted cities in the world are in India. And according to the Central Pollution Control Board or CPCB data, Delhi is the most polluted city in India in terms of air quality. And the same has been highlighted by this article according to this graph. Further, this news article highlights that there is lack of online monitoring of air quality in most of the cities. And further, these cities do not have an emergency response plan to tackle air pollution. And we know that there is a graded response action plan for the city of Delhi in case of air pollution emergency. So other cities in India lack such an emergency response plan. In this background, let us look at some of the suggestions that have been provided by WHO for handling the pollution emergencies and monitoring and handling the situation of air pollution in a better manner. So some of the suggestions provided by the World Health Organization to tackle the problem of air pollutions include First, that air quality monitoring in low and middle income countries needs to be strengthened and especially in areas close to hospitals, schools and workplaces. The second suggestion provided by the WHO includes the development of low cost sensors and other new technologies that can expand air quality monitoring and forecast to areas which are presently uncovered. Thirdly, it provides for new protocols and standards which are needed to guide effective use of interpretation of data produced by the low cost sensors. Fourthly, the suggestion says that all countries should work towards meeting the WHO Global Air Quality Guidelines to enhance health and safety of children. Further, the suggestions say that governments should adopt measures like 
reducing the overall dependence on fossil fuels and a global energy mix which includes renewable energy etc. It further highlights that improvement should be done in energy efficiency and facilitating the uptake of renewable energy sources. Further the suggestions highlight that there needs to be better waste management and this can reduce the amount of waste that is burned within the communities and it will help in reducing the community air pollution. Further the suggestion provided by WHO provides for exclusive use of clean technologies and fuel for household cooking, heating and lighting devices. And these efforts can drastically improve the air quality within homes and in surrounding community. So these are some of the suggestions provided by WHO for improving the air pollution problem. And these can be used in answering various questions related to air pollution that are asked in the mains examination. With this let us move on to the next article. Now this article on page number 9 is based on the latest data which has been released by the central board of direct taxes and it is related to the tax collections. So this highlights that the number of taxpayers and the tax returns file has increased. However, the tax collections have not increased accordingly. So in this respect, the article highlights the reasons for the same. So in this article, we will try to understand what does the report of Central Board of Direct Taxes highlight, what could be the possible problem and the reforms that are required in the tax laws as suggested by this author. So this will form a part of the General Studies Paper 3 of the Mains Examination under the topic Economic Development. Now the report by the Central Board of Direct Taxes highlights that the number of taxpayers and the tax returns filed has increased drastically over the last four years. However, the report highlights that the share of taxes collected from the richest Indians or those Indians which are in the highest tax slabs in the total tax collected has decreased as compared to the increase in the number of tax returns. In contrast of the above observation, the report highlights that relatively low income groups are paying a larger proportion of the total tax collected. So the author says that this is an interesting observation because the number of taxpayers has increased over this period of last four years. However, the tax collections have not increased accordingly. So further the author highlights the possible reasons for such observations. Now the author has highlighted the reasons for lower increase in the collections of taxes as compared to the increase in number of people who have filed their returns. So in this line the author has highlighted that the average income reported by the low income group people has increased. However, this is not the case with high income groups and this has been highlighted in the graphs in the article. And these graphs highlight that the number of returns that have been filed above rupees 1 crore has increased. And similarly, the returns over 100 crores have also increased as compared to the year 2016-17. However, the share of these top 1% taxpayers in total tax payable has decreased as compared to 2016 and 17. And this can be seen in the graph here. Further, the share of top 5% taxpayers in total tax payable has also decreased as compared to 2016 and 17. So this is one of the points that has been highlighted by the author. Further, the author has highlighted the Global Wealth Report 2018, which is published by Credit Suez. So this is an important fact for us from prelims point of view and should be noted. And this report has highlighted that there are at least 3,400 Indians who have an annual income of more than rupees 50 crores. But out of these 3,400 Indians, only 179 of them have reported this income of income to the tax authorities. So the number of people reporting income more than 50 crores is just 179 as compared to the estimated number that is 3,400 people. Further, the authors say that the share of reported non-salary income in the gross income of individuals has declined over the years. Now among the citizens that file the tax returns, there are two kinds of people. These are the salaried people and then there are the non-salaried people. And these non-salaried people include self-employed professionals and these include lawyers, doctors, accountants and private education institutions like private tuitions etc. So the author has highlighted that these people who are professionals or self-employed people continue to underreport their income. And that is why the share of non-salaried income in the gross income of individuals has declined over the years. So the aspects that have been highlighted in the last slide highlight that a large number of high income individuals grossly underreport their income. This means that the high income individuals are not filing their correct income with the tax authorities and which has been highlighted by the report by Credit Suez which says that there are about 3400 Indians who have income higher than 50 crores 
However, only 179 people above their income of 50 crore have filed tax returns with the tax authorities. Further, the author has highlighted that schemes like income declaration scheme and the measures announced by the government to reduce tax evasion has failed. Further, the author says that the implementation of GST helps in reducing tax evasion by the MSMEs. However, it cannot address the main problem of tax evasion and avoidance by high income individuals and big corporates. In this regard, the author has highlighted certain reforms in the tax laws. And in this line, the author says that the law should mandate filing of returns by all professionals regardless of their profits. And we know that there has been underreporting by self-employed individuals. Further, the author says that the law does not provide for a clear-cut definition of admissible expenditures for the companies. Now, due to this lack of clear-cut definition related to the expenditure for the companies, these companies while filing returns show that and by under-reporting the profits and over-reporting the expenditures, these companies artificially reduce their profit and further reduce their tax liability. And due to this, the tax contributed by such companies is less. So in this line, the authors say that there should be clear-cut definition of admissible expenditures for the companies. Further, the authors have highlighted that the tax exemptions have also led to tax avoidance. And we know that various tax exemptions are provided to various companies. And the authors have highlighted that this has led to increase in chances of tax avoidance. And these features of tax exemptions have unfairly benefited the big corporates or high income individuals. And finally, the author has highlighted that the tax law has to act as a deterrent for tax evasion by imposing fine on the tax evaders. That means that tax law should be made more stringent so that they can act as deterrent for tax evasion. With this, let us move on to the next article. Now, these articles on page number 1 and page number 10 are in news because of the recent Indo-Japan summit and the details of Indo-Japan relations from your examination point of view and international relations point of view have already been discussed in the Daily News Simplified of 27th October 2018 by Navid sir. So, you should refer to this video to get the details of Indo-Japan relations. With this, we have come to the end of today's discussion. Now, let us move on to the question for the day.